Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to Read Initiative. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth from Garforth Education, and today I'm very excited to be joined by Rachel Donnelly, and we are speaking about her role as a school psychologist, and she is also the president of the Reading League Maryland, which we'll be speaking about in more detail later. Earlier this week, you will find an episode where we talk about your journey. And today we are focusing on your role as a school psychologist. So thank you for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. So I want to start off with how do you define a role as a school psychologist? Because, you know, I I find that educators or teachers will know that they're in their building. They're nobody someone to ask for. And they'll just assume they're just someone that does a psych ed, right? And to refer students to, but not really have a true understanding of their training or their job. For sure. Um, you know, and it really varies uh, kind of like where and what district you're, you're working in and what capacity they're using school psychologists. So um, I've been in a couple different states here in the US. And I remember when I first transitioned over to, to North Carolina, I was in HR filling out paperwork and I was, somebody else was sitting next to me and they said, you know, oh, well, what do you, what do you do? What do you, what position are you uh, here for? And I'm a school psychologist. And she's like, oh, a tester like somebody that tests people. Oh, okay. I was like, well, no, we do more than that. Cause you know, I was relatively new out of grad school and you're trained as a school psychologist in kind of this data analysis and systems change and behavioral interventions and social emotional learning and safety and crisis and threats and like all these things. Um, and then I was kind of insulted that she would just say, oh, I'm a tester. That's what you do, you test. And, you know, going into it, I was, I was annoyed. And then I quickly found out that in North Carolina, that, that's pretty much what school psychologists would do because the caseloads were so high. We're the only ones that could give a cognitive evaluation legally. Um, you know, other people weren't credentialed to do that. And there were so few of us that, and so much work to be done, that that's all that we were really used for. So I didn't do counseling. I didn't really do much with behavior. Um, you know, we had uh, school counselors and things that we, and social workers that would feel, fill that role, but I, I basically tested all the time. Um, and, you know, when I moved out, then I went to Texas after North Carolina and the role was very different there. I saw like, I had like 30 on my counseling caseload. And in addition to that, I like ran all the IEP meetings, uh, which is something that I'd never done before. I certainly sit in on IEP meetings, but I've not been in charge of scheduling and managing and actually running um, all the meetings, even children that I didn't see for counseling. Um, and then when I came to Maryland, the, the role was much broader there. Um, we had a smaller kind of range ratio um, of school psychs to, to, to students. And so we were, um, were able to do more. So I'm more varied in my role. Um, North Carolina, I probably tested 120 kids a year. Here in Maryland, I probably test 40. And that kind of frees me up to, to do the counseling and to do the behavioral stuff and the social emotional stuff and, and all that. So it just, it really depends, but we are trained, ready, willing, and able to do all the things. It's, um, you know, up to the districts to hopefully, and we do as a, as a national organization, for sure, advocate for, you know, we, we want ratios of about, you know, one school psychologist for every 500 or so um, uh, students um, across the board. That's, that's not really what's happening in the field. I, I want to say I'm probably... I'm not Really one per school or two per school, depending on which school yeah. you're in, at least with the numbers of schools that we see in larger metropolitan areas. For sure, for sure. And so I have two elementary schools right now, so I probably serve about a thousand, more than a thousand kids, um, but that's probably the best ratio that I've worked in before. Um, so that's that's looking good to me, but I know that, you know, we need to do better and you know, broaden the role even more because there, there's for sure more that I think school psychologists can be doing and are trained and we know data and we know, um, you know, progress monitoring and we can do all these things, but yeah. So then my next question is, what would your ideal role look like as a school psychologist? Mm -hmm. if, if you could set everything up for how you would ideally like to work so that you could 
have the biggest impact for the students that you are in charge of or within your quota? Yeah, I mean, if, uh, of course, I would want to be kind of in a, a smaller, you know, less students or, or another school psychologist, at least to kind of manage the load um, with it would free me up to, to do more things. I mean, you know, I, I talk, spoke last time about each school psychologist. I think we're, we're all very different in how we're trained and what our interests are. And I like, you know, the academic evaluation and progress monitoring, all that stuff with the reading um, and, and other areas. And so if I, you know, I, I'm working with a child, um, you know, doing a little bit of an intervention with the, with the 100 Lessons book and whatnot, a child that, you know, um, we, we couldn't fit into another intervention program, so there wasn't space. We didn't have to, to get him in what he needs, you know, uh, skills that are far, far lower than what he should be, hadn't had schooling prior to coming to us. And so, um, you know, I'm hearing things like, oh, I, he's the lowest child in reading that I've seen in 30 years and, and all these things. And so, um, you know, we weren't going to be able to, to meet his needs or do anything. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm, I would like to work with him as much as I can. I'm here at the school for three days a week. If somebody else can maybe pick up two other days, let's let's run this intervention and, and work with the student. And I just love doing that. He's, you know, working with students and seeing that click and seeing that progress um, to me is so fulfilling. Um, so I'd love to do more of like the data analysis, the intervention, the progress monitoring, MTSS stuff, I guess, would be yeah. kind of what I would um, strive to do if I in my way. <laughs> yeah, and I know at least up here and a lot of school psychologists that I've spoken to, it's basically they're there for the rubber stamp to get the inclusionary criteria to get those special education services. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of like the gatekeeper. But I think we need to move them up further up the river mm -hmm. uh, and have it so that they're helping and supporting those primary school teachers in the first few years so that they can really understand the screening and the progress monitoring and how that ties to their classroom teaching, small group teaching, and the intervention, because that in turn is going to lower the school psychologist's caseload, yes, right? For sure. Because if, if we're catching them early, not getting them to that crisis point, we're going to help save these children's lives. And I'm not trying to be dramatic here. It, it is true. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to reduce behavioral issues. We're going to reduce the, the pull on special education services because we're able to screen and filter out. And, it, you know, it, screening students is not a difficult process. It is something that a classroom teacher can easily learn to do. And you were saying that you were out of school three days a week. Imagine what you could do if, you know, that first month of school, you're really helping the teachers get the screening happening. It's more important that they do it than you do it, right? Because it's gonna give them the most valuable information. And then you help them decide about group placement and interventions. Think about how much time that would give you throughout the rest of the year. Exactly, it's front loading and it's mm -hmm. prevention rather than you know response to when, we, when we're kind of past the point of no return. I mean, I'd love to, um, you know, as a school psychologist have more say or any say in curriculum choices. You know, they, these decisions are made up in the board of ed and we don't, we're not consulted or spoken about. So school psychologists are often seen as people that, yeah, can test for a learning disability. They might know something about dyslexia. They might, you know, but at the same time, they don't come to us to ask about what's an effective curriculum. And I'm not saying that all school psychologists are curriculum nerds like I am, mm -hmm. um, but it would be nice, yeah, if, if we were thought of maybe to have a seat at the table when maybe we're talking about which curriculum we're going to be using or what we're looking at purchasing type of thing. Um, yeah. Well, and also I think it's important to recognize each school psychologist's niche or, or their passion mm -hmm. because even though you said that you're at two elementary schools, the one down the road may have a student that would really benefit from you and you have one that would benefit from them. So just say, you know what? I'm gonna take on that student, you take on this student because we're gonna see more progress and it's the best interest for the child, for the children and students for us to do this. And also I'm gonna enjoy it more. 
because it's my jam. Whereas, yeah, I totally understand. I have the training. I can do the other stuff, but I'm so much more adept at working with these situations and I can see it and know it and very quickly pick it up. I know that two of my passions are executive functioning and that the academic side of things and just understanding how those two marry so well together. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, some of the other issues that the school psychologist might come across, you know, more the social emotional, I understand them. I can work with them. But you're gonna, I'm gonna do so much better for those kids that have that academic and um, work, or sorry, not working memory, but executive functioning issue than the one that need that social and emotional support. Yeah, totally. I, we are absolutely on the same page. And luckily, like my district is, is pretty large. So we have, I don't know, probably close to 100 school psychs on staff. And my boss is really good at knowing. Yeah, they're, they're jam, like who, who to go to when we have a, a you know, I need to, or a social emotional, uh, you know, summer program needs to be organized. She, she has her go-to person for that. You know, she knows who to, who to ask on staff, who, who specialized in some of these things. And so it does allow us to, you know, kind of spread our expertise around, um, you know, a little bit better, but yeah. Now, One thing, like I know in my teacher education program, there wasn't much discussion about school psychologists other than, you know, this is their job. This is what they do. What would you, if you had a class of pre-service teachers to spend, you know, a whole three hour lesson or lecture, whatever you want to call it with them, what are the high points that you think it's important for them to take away about school psychology and the way that you can use the school psychologist to help support you in the classroom? Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, I, I would want them to, to know that, that we're reachable. So sometimes um, schools kind of use us as, well, you don't go right to the school psychologist. You don't go, you know, that that's for the kids that are have kind of like going down the pipeline somehow. I love it when teachers like stop me in the hall and just say, hey, can you, can you pop into my room and, and lay eyes on this kid? Um, You know, I'm having trouble here, you know, let me know what you think. And I I like kind of that on the fly consultation. So I think that's important as a school psychologist to be kind of approachable and available and ready to do that, that you're not in this like a glass tower of an office and that only certain people are comfortable coming to you and talking about these things. So I'd want teachers yeah, to know that you know, I'm, I'm a resource for the school. I work for the school um, and, and I'm available to do whatever I can to, to help out. Um, I've certainly, I've, I've tried to get my principals and whatnot to like give me a staff meeting where I can talk about like, I really like like the instructional hierarchy and like learning theory and that progression of how learning happens because it lines up so nicely with kind of science of reading stuff. It lines up so great with, with any type of learning. It's the progression of how, how we learn. And I think that understanding that progression and what type of instructional tactics are appropriate for which stage of learning is really valuable to teachers. Um, you know, it, it's time is so valuable in schools and there's certain number of PD days devoted and there's so much to get through and required trainings that I've not gotten that opportunity yet where just like, give me the school and let me talk to them about learning. I'd love to do that. Um, but yeah, that would be like my goal. Like, give me a bunch of teachers and let's talk about how we learn. Yeah, because, you know, I think one thing that we're missing is that understanding of how the brain to, learns to, to do different things and the processes. And the vast majority of teachers are people who enjoyed going to school, didn't struggle in school. And a lot of things probably came fairly easy to them. Like maybe their, you know, math isn't their favorite. And they're like, well, it's okay. You know, you don't have to be good at math, but not really understanding what you can do to support that. And I, I see many um curricular materials and you know they have the pieces but they're not quite in the right place I I know one thing that I see frequently for mathematics instruction is you know it technically has that concrete representational abstract format but when 
it's actually being used. It's not using efficiently and helping build the bridges between having the students work manipulatives and understanding how the concept works and then going from the manipulatives to representing it on paper uh, with pictures and then just using the numbers and the letters or the symbols that they need to do to represent it. Yeah, I see that, that that's a, you know, a big kind of discussion in, in math right now is this conceptual understanding versus like procedural knowledge, right? Like this under, do I know what this means and how this works and knowing like the, the algorithm of, you know, to do something quickly to, to figure out the math problem and, and people like pin those two against each other. Like it's either this or this, not understanding that like it's both, like mm -hmm. you need to, it helps you in your learning to understand why these things, why, how we are regrouping, you know, the, the ones in bringing it over into the tens and forming a new 10, like we need to understand like why, but they also need to learn how to do these things quickly and efficiently. And so they need to know, okay, you carry this number over here and bam, and you add it up because fluency is so important, especially in math, just like with reading. If you're not fluent in reading, you're not gonna be able to get meaning out of it. If you're not fluent in, in the math, when you get into these multiple step problems, you're, you're working memory so overburdened. Um, and so, yeah, I see kind of misconceptions and um, misunderstandings with, within math, kind of similar to reading, but you're right that, that starting with that conceptual understanding and then also bringing in, you know, it's super important. And yeah, I, there's so much pseudoscience in education. There's so much mythology in education. And I mean, I just went to a PD for the district a couple of days ago, I think last week, and there was just all sorts of nonsense in there that I mean, like teachers have have better things to do than focusing on these things that really aren't going to be effective. Like, let's focus on what we know works instead of bombarding teachers with pseudoscientific things that it just takes up time, it's stressful for them, and it doesn't, it's not super helpful. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> now, I know when we initially spoke, um, we were talking about like cognitive load and working memory and processing speed and how we both thought that it was important that people, teachers had a better understanding of what they were. What would be your elevator speech of these? And what do you think is really important for teachers to take away, especially when we're working with students with diverse ne learning needs and recognizing that they may struggle with the concept, but still have a high processing speed? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, elevator speech. That would be tough because I could go on and on and on and I would struggle to be kind of concise. Okay, For so sure. let's start out. What's cognitive load theory? So, I mean, so with anything, you have to understand that, you know, it takes energy to, to focus on one thing. And then really, we're not like people aren't serial processors, right? We're not able to actually do two things at the same time and multitask. You can shift back and forth <laughs> to different things and people can get really good at that, but you're not like doing two separate things. Your brain isn't like over here working and over here working on two different type of things. And so you need to, yeah, be efficient so that you can do things automatically, I guess would be my, my main, um, you know, it's just like like learning to drive a car, right? So when you're first learning to drive a car, um, you know, you're like- So <laughs> many things. Yeah, they're like, oh my gosh, okay, this, this gotta check the mirror, gotta do this because it's not automatic for you, right? So you have to, you've been taught, you might know how to do it, but to manage changing the radio station at the same time that you're like hyper aware of everything, that's like asking too much. It's like on top of, you can learn to change the radio station and take the phone call or do whatever once you automate the, the rest of the things. Once you're a proficient car driver, right? We don't think about, oh, got to put my signal on. We, we just do these things because we become so fluent and so automatic. And like, that's how we need to get with a lot of these academic skills to be so fluent and automatic to bypass the working memory. So we're not like hyper aware of everything and, and like balancing all these different plates. You need to get so masterful at these things. And when people tell me, you know, oh, this kid, it's not, it's not sticking. It's not staying in, in long-term memory. Like I talk to teachers about, you have to kind of um, over-practice it. It needs to become so automatic 
Um, and that's the thing, like if I see, if we've done testing and there's a kid with slow processing speed or slow working memory, um, knowing that um, it's, it's not necessarily changing what my recommendations are gonna be for the child because we all need to learn to that level. And we know the tactics that we need to get there. So whether or not it, your working memory is impaired, you still need to get to that level of automaticity. And there's still the same instructional practices to get there as if you have a working memory in the average range versus working memory that's not in the average range. I'm not gonna change kind of how I'm recommending. There might be accommodations and things that need to happen. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, and then I love, I, can I talk a little bit about the instructional hierarchy? Cause I, I love that. Can we first define working memory and processing speed and then how the three are connected? Yeah. And the thing is though, too, in theory, I, I kind of make a distinction in my head between how these things, these things are definitely like real constructs and real things that people are different by people. And then there's like what we're able to measure of that. And those are two different things. But but first, let's yeah, talk about kind of what that is. So working memory is kind of like what you hold in your memory and your short term memory can maybe manipulate or, or work around and then kind of, you know, bring back out again. So on, on some of our cognitive tests, it might be, you know, numbers or letters kind of reversed where I say 275, now tell that to me backwards. So you have to tell it in a short-term memory, you have to like flip it around and then put it back out. You're, you're manipulating um, the information kind of in real time. Um, and then processing speed would be kind of, um, you know, how quickly you can go through, all, uh, you know, simplistic information. Um, and, and on our cognitive tests that can, they test that in many different ways. And I would argue that the different ways you test it matter and that you know in academics it it matters kind of what skill you're looking at but um so on some of our measures it's like a, a visual scanning like can i find this this object amidst these other objects <laughs> how quickly can i do that so they're timed timed assessments or you know how rapid you know rapid automatized naming like how fast can i na label these objects um you know visual discriminations auditory stuff so there's different ways to measure processing so like, like overall um, how quickly you can um, recognize and make sense of information would be, I don't know, but maybe you have a better definition again. It's like kind of. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think that's a great technical term, but basically what I, when I think of the things, when I'm, I'm trying to describe it at that basic level, mm -hmm. cognitive load is how much you can take in at one time. Working memory is how you're using things and you're able to use them. So if I give you a phone number, are you able to punch it in, right? If I'm dictating a sentence to you, can you write the whole thing or can you only do a couple words? When you're copying something off the board, how often do you have to go back and look to remind yourself what you're looking at and recognizing that that working memory comes into play in every aspect of reading and every aspect of life, mm -hmm. right? And then processing speed is how much it time it takes for it to sink in and you to understand. And the reason why I find these are so important for teachers to understand is because then when we go to something like accommodations, recognizing how that's supporting the task at hand and helping the teacher understand what they're really trying to measure in that activity. Mm -hmm. Um, because I find a lot of resistance to using various accommodations, such as using a calculator. Well, the reason why we're doing that in something where we're not checking automaticity and fluency of basic math fast is because that is too much of a cognitive load for the child to hold their information in their working memory and process it before they can actually do the question that you want them to do like nine plus five to get to 14, carry the number, whatever, that's just using up so much of their brain power that they don't have enough to go on to the next step in a, in a process or in a, a logical, timely manner that's going to make it so they can't do as much work. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be truly measuring what you're trying to measure in the class. And if everybody else in the class can do that, no problem. It's not like you're just getting the right the answer at the bottom of the page. You're wanting to see the process, but you're helping it happen in a more efficient manner. And then, you know, when we're talking about preloading students and one of the things, you know, 
that I loved about university as someone that has a learning disability is getting my syllabi in advance and knowing the books that were going to be read and, you know, the, the order of things so that I could pre-read before going into a lecture. And if we give our students that struggle with processing speed the opportunity to front load. So if you're reading a novel in class and you're going to be discussing a chapter um, or doing something, let them do it the night before. So they already have it in their mind. So they're not starting from scratch, allowing them to be on more of an even playing field so that the students that can pick it up and move forward from it just from the lesson are able to do that. And it just helps balance things out. And so even sure. things like I love post-it notes. I think post-it notes are a great uh, accommodation <laughs> and Having the teacher write the homework assignment on a post-it note to write it on the board so they don't forget it, like write it down correctly, and then just stick it on the student's nest that doesn't have the ability to copy it down into their agenda, right? Yeah, I think, you know, when you hit on uh, thinking about what you're measuring, what you're trying to, what you're trying to figure out with a test question or with an assessment, and yeah, if you want to know, do they understand how to figure out how to work a word problem? Um, and you don't, uh, you don't, you're not trying to assess their, their fluency with math facts, then yeah, like use a calculator because otherwise, if they're really poor with their math facts, that's going to impede their ability to show you what they know about the, the word problem, you know, so understand reading the word problem to them, because if they yes. can't read the problem, they can't get it right. Exactly. Like, they can't understand what they're being asked, but if you read it to them and they could, yeah, like that's yeah. the difference between an A plus and a. I had a supervisor earlier on that, you know, when we're giving a cognitive evaluation, we're so strict on, um, you know, how the directions are presented and whatnot. And she told me that, like, you also have to be mindful of, are you measuring what the test wants to measure? And so if a child doesn't understand the task, you know, just reading the prompt and then going right into the task, knowing that they have no clue, is that going to be a valid measure of what you're trying to measure? Probably not. So it might be better that to try and reteach and re-explain and then note that in the test, like the extra rep, extra, you know, instruction was given. But then once you see a click and ah, now they can actually like take the test and give me a valid measure of, of what the test is, not that I, the instructions used vocabulary that they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that that's important for sure. You know, can they access? The, the task and understand what you're asking. But, um, and then uh, along what you're saying, I would make the distinction too between short-term memory and working yes. memory with the short-term, you know, what's you being held and then brought back and that working memory, like, you know, might be some of that manipulation type of thing going on with understanding of the, the information before you are having to then use it again. Um, but yeah, and you know, I, I find it interesting. So Again, I, I made that distinction about, you know, processing and working memory and those things and how they're different for different people and they can absolutely impact how a person interacts with a task or, or does something. And then we have these cognitive measures that say that we measure this, this, and this. We do processing, speed, we do working memory. Um, you know, we know all tests have measurement error. And so every test is not just, that number is not just a pure, like that is 100% an indicator of their working memory. There's a large amount of error in there just um, just regular everyday test measurement error. And so, um, you know, a lot of times I've found that school psychologists, teachers can overinterpret um, cognitive scores and cognitive indices, because we know that there's a lot of research that shows that you know, cognitive profiles, when, when school psychologists do this, they look at, okay, there's a weakness here in working memory, and there's a strength in processing speed, and so this is going to mean this and that and that, and that's what the, it's going to mean in the classroom. So again, you're testing the kid in the office, very different environment than in the classroom. You're assuming that these tests are adequately measuring the construct that you're looking to measure, um, and that that's going to have kind of a meaningful impact on how you handle the student in the classroom. And what the research has shown us is that that's not really the case, right? So um, when we've looked at functional like outcomes of like we have this uh, student, we gave them a cognitive evaluation, we use the cognitive test scores to figure out like how to program for them in some capacity. Does the student do better than a control group um, that didn't have this type of information? And we find that like it, it's not helpful, right? Mm -hmm. So um, basing instruction off of cognitive scores 
um, whether that's processing, working memory, whatnot, or basing accommodations off of those scores, um, actually doesn't have meaningful outcomes for students. And so that's why I try to get teachers not so hung up on the scores. Like if we know that the post-its gonna help them, if we know that they're slow at getting the work completed, maybe they need extra time. I don't need to do a cognitive evaluation to test their processing speed to say, yeah, you need extra time. Because what happens is if the kid comes up and has average processing speed, like clearly that's not happening in the classroom. I'm still gonna say, probably benefit from extra time. Like you have, you know, as a teacher that this kid takes longer than everybody else in the classroom to get their math done. So yeah, like that seems like a useful thing to do for a child um, because we don't have the data that shows that children, you know, respond differentially to these type of accommodations that the kid with a low processing speed is going to, you know, benefit from that accommodation more than a kid that has average processing speed. And so, um, you know, I just, I just find that uh, interesting and teachers are often like, oh, they have a processing problem. I'm like, okay, well then let's look at what accommodations might be useful. Let's trial and error some accommodations, but you probably don't need me to give you, like, to give the kid a cat test to make inferences. Because like I said, if they have average, I'm gonna say, well, that's not what happens in the classroom anyway. So does it really matter? And if they come out low, I just say, you were right. Like it, it's not really um, super helpful is in my perspective. Again, not that those things aren't real, different but that our tests aren't as accurate as we think and they are hard to measure and there's other things that come into the situation like anxiety yeah discomfort with the tester like you're taking a kid plucking them out putting them with a person that they're not necessarily familiar with and comfortable with mm -hmm. and they're being asked to do tasks that are designed to be novel these are not things that the kids are supposed to be yeah. recognizing and learning like oh yeah i did that yesterday this is this is how you do it right we want to see how it is and one thing that I wanted to mention about this whole conversation about processing speed, cognitive load, and working memory is if you're seeing, you know, a student that has a psych ed or whatever evaluation highlighting this information and they're having behavior issues in the problem, it might be worth tapping that school psychologist on the shoulder and saying, can you come into the class during this time and tell me what you see? Mm -hmm. Because it may be that, you know what, this kid's low, like, you are loading this kid up so much. They do not have the capacity to remember what you're asking them to do. So you're setting them up for failure from the get-go. They cannot succeed. They're not even going to try. That's why they're checking out or that's why they're acting out. And I think that's one of the most valuable things that a school psychologist or someone that has the understanding of how all these behaviors work and a little bit of the executive function or those um, CEO of the brain uh, to understand how that's actually affecting the student's behavior and learning in your classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on. I mean, the, and we know that things like IQ tests I mean, they predict a, a good amount of, of what a how a child's gonna perform academically. It's something like the variance made up is like 60%. So if I give an IQ, have an IQ score, like I can, you know, 60% of their academic achievement, I, in some cases, like I, I can predict based on that, but there's another 40% in there that's not related to cognitive factors. That's, you know, anxiety and behavior and uh, distractibility and all these other things and exposure and, and teaching uh, quality that, that is gonna, contribute to how the student learns and what they're learning and, um, you know, what skills are missing. And yeah, it, it's more complicated than just, it, it's not simple. We know anything about the brain. I, I always feel like um, I say that like anybody that, that talks a lot of, like a whole lot about the brain and seems to feel like they know all about the brain. Usually I feel like they don't know enough about the brain to know that we don't know enough about the brain as a whole. There's still like so much, to, so much that we don't know. So anybody that's like confident about the brain definitely does this. And this is why I'm like, mm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, for sure. Um, so I know kind of bouncing around topics here, but there's so many important ones that I think we need to help demystify. Uh, for the role of the school psychologist and what they do. And one of them is, I'm sure, a good part of your job is writing reports. What are the big things that you want the school psych or the, the person reading the point, whether it's a parent or a teacher or a principal or a special educator, um, 
to really take from that report because most of the time they are more than one page. Uh, they do contain a lot of really valuable information, but they can be confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like school psychologists um, and some of us struggle with this, including myself included. Um, we need to do a good job of writing a good summary that's concise and um, hits the highlights because we have to understand that, yeah, they can be long reports and I'm not gonna expect people, honestly. I mean, when I get a psych report in from a kid, do I read everything word by word? Like, no, I, I look at the scores. I look at the summary, like I know what I'm looking for. Um, but I, I just know that, and when I'm typing these long reports up too, I have to remind myself, like I, I, it needs to be done concisely. It needs to be done in language that the parents and teachers can understand. It shouldn't be filled with jargon. Um, and it should recognize its limits. Just like when we're using a test and we need to recognize its limits as far as what it can test and how it can test and the accuracy of that test, we need to you know, not make jumps in conclusions that aren't supported by the data. Um, so yeah, I can't tell anybody like a secret key to understanding or reading a psych report, but my hope would be that that psychologist you know, is skilled enough to, to make a concise, understandable summary that at least can kind of tie a nice bow on um, the major take homes. And not that I'm saying just go to the summary and read the summary and, you know, discount everything else, but a school psychologist, a psychologist that's writing a report should know that that summary um, needs to be able to really communicate the overall message of what's, what the data is telling us. Mm -hmm. And then there's some people that will say, oh, well, that was done last year. It's, it's not valid. Or, you know, that was done two years ago. And yes, there is the importance of getting, um, you know, additional psycho eds done. But you don't want to have it within two years of each other. There needs to be space. And just because there is learning that has taken place doesn't mean that it's not accurate of where the student was and it cannot give you information that how about how to help them in the future. Yeah, I think that we need to be mindful of the purpose of what that uh, psych eval is trying to achieve. Like, what is the referral question that they're trying to answer? Is it they're trying to figure out if it could qualify for special ed? Are they trying to figure out if they qualify for counseling? Are they trying to figure out what the present levels are? Because we need information to write a goal. Are they like, what, what, what are we doing? Are they looking at a change in placement? Does this kid need a more restrictive setting? Like, what is the report uh, trying to answer? What question? And so, yeah, I would argue that you probably don't, some people think, oh, every, every two years, every three years, we need, we need an updated psych about. And my, my response to that is, is why? Like, what, what question are you trying to answer? Because if the last one is seems representative, they had a learning disability two years ago, do we have reason to su suspect that that's changed? No, okay, so if we don't need, if we're not questioning that we, we got the diagnosis right, um, then we probably don't need a psych eval to reconfirm that diagnosis unless, you know, we have legitimate questions there. You know, if we have classroom data that shows, okay, this is where the child is in their phonics progression, we know where we're going, like, do you need a psych eval to, to tell you where they are and maybe you have sufficient data already? And so I always kind of think, what, what question are you trying to answer? And do you, do you have the data to answer that question already? Um, and so oftentimes, I, I, yeah, I don't think that you need an updated psych eval just for the purpose of updating a psych eval. If you still feel that it's representative, they're autistic before and they, you know, three years later, we're not questioning that, um, you know, and there might be more benefit to updating um, just the educational portion or getting more curriculum based assessment, you know, how are they reading their science textbook, are they reading with sufficient accuracy and speed to be able to access the science content in that classroom. Um, you know, those might be more useful kind of uses of, of time, um, but just uh, were observations in the classroom to see how that ADHD is looking now or how, you know, if there's anything else interfering, those are more useful um, data points to me than just like doing a psych eval because it's time <laughs> or we think it's time. Yeah, I mean, typically here and in Canada, what we see is there is, well, first of all, most people have to pay for them because schools will often only get two or three a year. 
uh, for their entire student body, uh, just because there's such a limited supply of the ones within the school. So families are often forced, if they're able to, to pay for a private assessment. And then typically they like to be redone before you go to high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and then typically as you leave high school, because most universities require to have a psychoeducational assessment done within the past two years, if you're going to get any accommodations at the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, for someone who did a lot of schooling, <laughs> a lot of university, having the university say that I need a new one, like, well, been dyslexic every other time. <laughs> Surprise! Still been in school, not paying for another one. Not cheap. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know, I when I worked at the high school level, um, I would frequently get requests. You know, parents would come and say, "We're, you know, we're a senior. We're going off to college. Like, I want an updated. Uh, like, the university wants an updated psych eval." And oftentimes, you know, for in the realm of special education, you know, that isn't something that, at least in the states that we're funded to do. You know, mm -hmm. we're paid to to identify disabilities and plan for education, and we're not funded to take care of what what happens in you know, if, if a child goes to college. But what I found is that when we contact um, the universities and we ask, you know, what, why do you need updated type of things? Would a letter suffice? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they'd be like, yeah, a letter would be fine. So I would type up like a little paragraph to say, you know, this last psycho ed said this, um, these were the scores. We're still seeing things consistent with that. I, I judge this to be a, a valid representation of current skills, and I send it off, and, and they're good to go with that. Well, I, on my podcast, we brought on, um, I'm trying to think of her name, but she is um, a speaker in terms of, she, she helps with accommodations and disability planning in college. And so, um, you know, she came and spoke to us and kind of said that it really varies university by university. Um, some have stringent, like you need to be tested on an adult normed IQ test, da, 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 da. And, but many of them, again, it's kind of like, what purpose are you, are you trying to achieve with this? And if it's just to check the box that I had an IQ test done with adult norms, like that to me is, is just unfair and like not necessary. Um, like you said, like just dyslexic before, like we don't have any reason to think that that has been remediated. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes I could get away with a letter. And so I would, you know, encourage people to maybe ask the university themselves. Um, and, and also knowing that, you know, just because a recommendation goes in a psych report or a recommendation or accommodation is on the IEP, that doesn't mean that at least here that you, you take that report and you get that accommodation at the university level. They, they, they have their own process. They review everything and they decide what accommodations you can have. So, yeah. <laughs> Now, one thing I do want to go back to, because it's not something that you mentioned that you were wanting to talk a little bit more, and that's more about learning theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so I love there's many kind of models of learning. Um, I won't say that one is kind of better than the other. I, I like the instructional hierarchy. Uh, it's been around since I want to say 78 or so. Um, there's been lots of research around it. And Dr. Amanda Vander Hayden is who turned me on to that. She does research in math. Um, she's the absolute most amazing. <laughs> um, and so, you know, and I wish, um, maybe I'll send you the visual if you want to post it later, but um, it breaks learning down into um, really like, like four categories or the progression of learning. Mm -hmm. um, and then all students start with a new skill. You're learning a new skill in what's called the, the acquisition stage of learning. And we know that in acquisition, um, you're not accurate because you haven't really learned how to do the skill. Um, you're super slow at it because you're, again, you're learning it. Um, and so, yeah, low accuracy, low speed. Um, and we know that there's certain instructional practices that are appropriate for a student in that acquisition yeah. level of learning. Um, being in explicit instruction being the, the number one, right? So you need to be taught how to do it. And this lines up again with science of science of reading stuff. Like you need to teach the kid how to do it. It should be not, it should be, you know, I do and we do and you do, and it should be very clear and very concise. And so this like discovery learning, try and figure it out on your own or just absorb it, like not efficient 
not efficient things to be doing with the student in the acquisition state. It's going to be frustrating, you know, if you're, you know, doing time assess like time fluency practice on things that they don't know how to do that drill and kill in that stage of learning is just going to be a hot mess. But then what happens when that student gets that explicit instruction, um, they move on to um, fluency stage of learning. Um, and this is when the accuracy raises so you, you, you know how to do it, um, but you're slow at it. And lots of times teachers see a student that, oh, they got 100% on their test. They know it. Like, let's move on to the next thing. They kind of skip this fluency building stage. And when I was talking about like teaching to automaticity, um, they're skipping that. And so when you're not acknowledging that we're not quick at something, um, you're not getting it into long-term memory. You're not getting it to a proficiency level that it can be generalized to other situations. And yeah, you're going to forget it in, in a few weeks if you're not you know, doing it. Um, so this fluency building stage is high accuracy, but low speed. And so we need to work with the students to use appropriate fluency building strategies, which are different from, the, um, from that acquisition stage in that um, the best thing to do in that fluency building stage is, is practice. And it doesn't, it should no longer really be that explicit instruction. They already know how to do it. If you're trying to explicitly teach them through the whole thing and they already know it, it that's going to become frustrating to them. And you're taking away from their practice time by trying to spell everything out for them. So that's when you can kind of walk away a little bit, give you know, time to practice. Hey, try it, try it. Now, now the drilling <laughs> can be efficient. Now the practicing the math plaques with the flashcards can be efficient. Now, you know, oh, here's a minute timed, you know, probe. Let's see how much you can do. Let's see if you can beat your score the next time we try and do that. So that's time to practice. And it's not flu It's not frustrating at that point because they know how to do it. In fact, it's like kind of exciting. They like to beat their scores. They like to get faster. They like to get better. You like to do things that you're good at. And at that point, they're good at it. They just need to practice um, to get better. So um, and then once you have mastered that and come up to a, a high level of fluency, you're more likely to retain it. You're more likely to generalize it. And that's into kind of your mastery stage of learning. And then there's generalization and things that, you know, then you can use things like discovery learning and project-based learning and things to try and generalize to other settings because that's not going to be frustrating at that point because they've been taught it. And so I like that progression of the instructional hierarchy because, again, it can be applied to reading just like um, when we're doing like a fluency intervention like repeated readings. Like we want to make sure that their phonics <laughs> are good before we're doing that. And, and you know, doing fluency practice um, before that is going to be frustrating. So it lines up nicely with science of reading, certainly lines up with, with how we learn math. Mm -hmm. uh, concepts and that we want that we want all those skills to be automatic before we move on to the next skill that's going to build upon that um, and it, it makes sense with um, you know learning to load or unload the dishwasher when I'm teaching my kids like first I'm teaching them I'm going to explicit instruction the coffee mugs go here this goes here you want to you know rinse this dish before it goes into the dishwasher you need to teach them and then, you know, just because I taught them doesn't mean that they're going to be experts now. Like, I need to watch them and make sure they get it. And then they need to practice and practice and practice. And then, like, it becomes automatic. If you stop that chain of learning before you get to automaticity, you're going to forget. And, yeah, so I just, I just love that conceptualization of same thing with, you know, learning to drive a car with, with any type of learning. Well, and I was talking about that brain knowledge that we have, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... I think the thing that is most important to me about that whole conversation is that we're designing instruction when we're using an instructional hierarchy to reach the most number of students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. While we can use, you know, discovery-based learning and more of those abstract learning concepts, there are going to be students in the classroom that do learn that way and can excel that way. But mm -hmm. point of public education is to teach the masses, not the not the top few percent. And having that more explicit strategic instructional strategy with the scaffolds to support is still going to support those other students. And it's not going to prevent them from learning. They may learn the concept better. Um, but we're trying to teach all, not just some. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> 
for sure. You know, and I, I find that model of, you know, how you progress through learning, you know, so useful for, you know, you're introducing a new lesson, you know, everybody, you're all in acquisition, you've not heard this before, like, I need to treat you, all. you know, and then you can go back and circle around and find the kids that that maybe it didn't click for. And so maybe some of these other kids are able to go on to the fluency. You can do some of your independent work and get your practice in and get faster at it. Um, and I'm going to work with you guys over here that need um, the need a little bit more. Oftentimes I find kind of, you know, that mismatch where um, a teacher will be like, oh, he's, you know, I'm, I'm practicing and practicing and I, he just, you know, and he's not accurate he's still in acquisition stage you're giving him independent worksheets to do and yeah that's not that's not going to cut it um or they're over teaching you know for for kids so just like yeah using that as kind of like you said like the whole to to meet everybody's needs and then you kind of need to do your tiered system support and see who needs what based on where they're at well and another thing that i like to highlight is even though you were designing your lessons to include that instructional hierarchy to get everyone, you can still throw those incidental teaching comments, instructions to have that differentiated instruction to keep the interest of the higher achieving students and add to it. Uh, one of these things that I, I love throwing in that I think helps all of the students, and if younger students or the ones that are struggling don't get it, it's not going to hurt them long term. Is anything when we're talking about that morphology and understanding the language at a deeper level? And it takes, you know, three seconds to throw in, oh, look, there's that, you know, root again. There's that affix again. Do you see it? Remember what that means? And you know, that's not necessarily something that kids are going to pick up on their own. Maybe there are some that do naturally acquire morphology without any explicit instruction whatsoever, but those are definitely few and far between. It's fascinating. Uh, it's something that I'm always looking to learn more about personally, uh, but it allows taking that level or that, that instruction to the next level without leaving the other students behind because they're not losing the crucial components of the lesson. They're just missing some of the, the bonus content. For sure. Yeah, I love that. And, and kind of teaching in the moment and, and giving that repetition across contexts, across situations. I mean, we know that that's just kind of good learning, you know, to space it out. To, it's not just, blah, here's all the information. And I expect you to know it now forever because we hammered it in at that one time. We know that spacing it out, <laughs> giving breaks between this, you know, even the switching subjects, you know, doing some reading practice, doing some math, going back to reading, that's going to be more useful than kind of this extended, you know, it's unfortunate that sometimes our education systems aren't set up in the manner to do some of the, <laughs> these things that we know might be best practice, but well, thank you so much for joining me today, Rachel. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I am definitely looking forward to our next conversation about the Reading League uh, because I think they're doing fantastic things. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fun.